they tell us that after that, winter will be back tonight, so just hang in there. I've got to wear this robe. You can fan yourself. We will make it through the morning. Got a lot of announcements today. I want to call on Kristen McCaskill to bring us our first announcement. Good morning. The Family Ministries um, Council Committee have been meeting, and we had Family Olympics in July. I don't know if you got here early enough to see some of the pictures, but it was a lot of fun. And so our goal is to, for the third Sunday of every month to have something that the families can come and do together. So the parents and the kids can all be silly and, and take a little break before the week starts again. So next Sunday, January the 20th, we are going to have family game night. It will not be quite as physical as Family Olympics. It can be as mild as Go Fish, but if you're at my house, Go Fish can get pretty competitive. We'll have bingo. Um, Russell Castile from Camp Lake Stevens has agreed to come, and he is going to lead in some fun games that if you've been to Camp Lake Stevens, there's one called Poop Deck. There's something about some cowboys. I don't, I'm kind of scared. So um, that's going to also be going on. We're going to play Bible trivia. And Russell's also going to lead us in some songs. So at 5 o'clock, there'll be a potluck dinner. So if you have not already broken your New Year's resolutions, you can come to the potluck dinner and I'm sure find something that will make you weak. Um, then in February, we, the third Sunday, we are aiming to do some type of parenting, um, speed dating game. We haven't really quite figured it out. But we're hoping that the, um, some parents that are professionals and have older children can come and tell those of us with younger children kind of to handle some different situations. And then in March, we're going to have a nutrition and fitness um, program for families. So that'll be interesting as well. And then in April will be the Stop for Hunger that's sort of mission oriented and that'll be the family project then. So we hope that you will join us next week and bring your competitive mind and get ready for some mental go fish. And that is a week from tonight, so that'll be a great night. And for the whole church family, we're going to have games that, that adults will enjoy, games children will enjoy, games that the children might be able to beat the adults. We'll have to see about that, but we'll have a good time together. Tonight we'll have regular Sunday evening service at 5. Next week is the family night dinner, the potluck. The week after that, the 27th, is the Hanalina concert in the CLC at 5 o'clock, and that's sponsored by our Messengers Youth Choir, and our youth choir members have tickets to that concert. And so uh, they also will be singing an opening. They'll be opening for handling. That'll be exciting. And hope that you can be there for that. So a lot of fun things coming up on Sunday evenings. Got a lot else going on in the life of our church. Our Wednesdays are very busy. Uh, we've got started a lot of our spring studies. And uh, Julie Williamson asked me to promote this study. It's the skin you live in. It's about, about building friendships across cultural lines. And it's basically about how do you get to know people who are different? different from you, and that's sometimes hard for all of us. And it's an interesting study about if you want to strengthen or build your relationships with people who are different racially, culturally, ethnically, and they can apply, be applied to a lot of situations, including generational differences. And so uh, if you want to beat, this study started last week, but if you want to pick up your book at the office, you can read the first chapters and be ready to jump right in this week. Also on Wednesday night, we'll be studying the book of Acts. We finished up Luke last week, and we'll move right into Acts this week. We have a lot of other interesting studies going on, so please take note of that whole middle page of your bulletin. Uh, oh yeah, speaking of studies, starting confirmation class this evening with the uh, current seventh graders. Uh, we have an interesting group. We had a great group last year. Very proud of my, my, my confirmation class from last year. But uh, we're going to have an outstanding group this year, mostly boys, apparently, and uh, that will be an adventure. But we will, we will have fun with that. That's 4 o'clock this afternoon. Hunter's going to help me teach it. And we will have a, we'll have a good time together. So look forward to that. A lot going on in the life of your church. Glad that you're here to share in this day today. But hope you'll share in some of the other things going on in the life of the church. Please be sure to take the attendance pads and sign your name to them and pass them around so that we can have a record of you being here. And now will you take your bulletin. Let's stand as we turn to our call to worship. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. Show me your ways, Lord, and teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come in hope, we come in joy, we come to worship this day. Bless us. We are here in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our hymn of praise is number 66. We'll sing all the verses.
remain standing as we share our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. And let us unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Most gracious God, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for a day with our family and a day in our church. We thank you for a chance to worship, for you have blessed us in so many ways. Your love is ever with us. Your Son has done so much for us, and your salvation is a real part of our lives. And so we thank you, and we praise you, and we sing your songs, and we worship your name. As we gather today, we do know those who are hurting. We have friends who have just gotten bad news from a doctor. We have friends who are fighting hard to recover from an illness or a surgery. We have friends who are just down. We have friends who are worried about a job or just worried. Be with them. Hold them. Let them draw strength from you. Let them feel your power, your hope. Let them see your tomorrow and know you as a light in the darkness. Help us to do everything we can. Help us to be a church of love and service. But help us to know when we've done everything we can that your power is still there and your power is still at work. Help us to be true disciples. Help us to be true followers of your Son that we might be the church you need us to be. We pray these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for our children. Good morning. Good morning. Fancy oh, dressed up. How are you? It's great to see you all. How are you? It's great to see you all, Sunny. Come around here because I want you to, I'm going to put something right here and I want you to be able to see what I've got down here. I think there's some people coming from upstairs. Hey, Happy New Year. Some of you I haven't seen this whole year. It's nice to see you. Can you see the two piles of things I've got here? Come on up. Come on, Brody. Can you see? Come around here, right here. So can you see what I've got up here? You know, there are things we do to prepare for certain activities and certain things. For instance, you heard Brother Giles say a while ago, and if you listen to the weather this morning, you know that in about six or eight hours, it's probably going to be really cold. Even though it's hot outside right now, the cold weather's coming. So if you had these two things before you, what would you choose to get ready for cold weather? What would you, what would you need up here to prepare for cold weather? Right, can you all see that? Scarf, hat, gloves. That'll help you prepare and be ready for the cold weather to come. Yes, ma'am? And a jacket. I didn't put a jacket down here, but you'll definitely need a jacket. And probably a raincoat, too. All right, what if you knew that school was about to start, say, in July or August? What do you do? You usually make a trip to the store. And buy some paper and glue. Mm -hmm. Paper, glue, markers, pencils. 
There are a lot of things to do to get ready for school to come. Those are just a couple things that we faced. Cold weather, going to school, things that we need to prepare for, things we need to get ready for. The Bible tells us that a man named John the Baptist told the people how to get ready for Jesus coming. We've talked about John the Baptist down here before. But he prepared the way for Jesus. He told people what they needed to do to get ready for Jesus to come. And the things he said in the Bible, some of the things he said for people to do to get ready for Jesus were help the poor, feed the hungry, be kind and fair to each other. Help the poor, feed the hungry, and be kind and fair to each other. Now, those are the things he told the people back then. Before Jesus was even starting his ministry, those are the things he said we'd need to do to get ready. But do you think, I think, those are things that followers of Jesus do still today. Help the poor, feed the hungry, be kind and fair. Those are just some of the things that followers of Jesus do. What I'd like for you to do when you get home this afternoon, maybe at lunchtime or maybe later on this afternoon, talk to your family about things that you do in your family to show that you are a follower of Jesus. What do you do in your family that helps you follow Jesus and helps other people know that you are a follower of Jesus? So talk to your folks about that when you get home. Will you pray with me right now? Dear God, we do love you so much. We pray, God, that you would come into our hearts, that you would lead our lives, and truly help us follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye. See you later. I'm glad your cast is all. 581, Lord, whose love through humble service. Let's stand together and sing all four stanzas. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you have blessed us with your Son. You have blessed us with many blessings. Accept these, our gifts. Take them, bless them, and use them. We bring them in the name of the Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
The story of John the Baptist from the third chapter of Luke's Gospel. Pick up with verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say for yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. What should we do then, they asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Starting off each new year, I'd like to spend a couple of sermons just talking about the basics, reminding us who we are and where we've come from, reminding us what's distinctive about being a Christian and what's distinctive about being a Christian, living out our Christian life in the Methodist way. And there are some particular things that Methodists believe. Now, most of what Methodists believe, all other Christians, just about all other Christians believe. The things we said in the, uh, 
in the Apostles' Creed. They are shared throughout the Christian church. And, and there are differences here and there, some subtleties, some matters of emphasis, but most of what we believe we share with other Christians. But there are some distinctive Methodist emphases, and we'll talk about them in another week. There are particular ways that Methodists organize and run their churches. There's a particular way that Methodists appoint their pastors, and there's a way that Methodists connect their churches together that some denominations just don't do. There are always certain songs, certain stories, certain, there's a certain heritage that is Wesleyan, that is Methodist, that is ours as Methodists. But Mr. Wesley, who founded our church, once said that none of those things are really the defining qualities of a Methodist. Methodism is about living out your faith. Methodism is about the fact how if we are loved by God, if we believe that Jesus Christ has already died for us, if we feel that God's grace is poured out upon us every day, if we believe that we're forgiven, saved, however you want to say it, then how do we live it? What do we do about it? How do we make it known? How do we act? If there's an emphasis in action over belief in Methodism, it's because of one important fact about the Methodists. John Wesley never intended for there to be a Methodist church. John Wesley was a member of the Church of England. He, in fact, he was a priest in the Church of England, and he was his entire life. He never intended to start another church. He hoped that Methodists would be a revival movement, uh, uh, an active force within the church. But he always assumed that Methodists were already Christians, that they were already members of a church. He would say that Methodism is just doing it right. But in reality, to be a Methodist in that day was kind of to be the, the peak class. It was kind of to be the special forces. It was kind of to be the advanced course in Christianity. Wesley only very reluctantly permitted the Methodists in America to form a church, and that was after the Revolution. As I said, most Methodists were members of the Church of England. And when 1776 came along and the Revolution, things kind of got sticky between the American Christians and the Church of England because the Church of England was the Church of England, and the King of England was the nominal head of the Church of England, and priests in the Church of England had to pledge their allegiance and say prayers for the King of England. You imagine that might have been a little difficult in 1777 or 1778. And as the war was over and we happened to win, things got even more tense and a lot of their priests went back home. And John Wesley, as, as royalist as he was, and he was a good Englishman and he was a good uh, Church of England man and he really never did understand why the Americans felt the need to revolt. But after the war was over, and there were thousands of Methodists who had moved to America, and they were without a church. Only then did he very, very reluctantly, his brother Charles got so angry at him, realized that something had to be done. And in 1784, he gave permission for the Methodists in America, not in England, but in America, to form the Methodist Episcopal Church, which eventually evolved into the United Methodist Church. We'll talk more about history on another day, but the point I'm trying to make is, in his day, John Wesley was a preacher. He was a revivalist. He was out to save souls. But the Methodist movement grew out of the, okay, what happens next? What do we do now? Okay, you're saved, and you know what that means on the day you die. But what does it mean for you to be saved on the day that you live? What does being saved mean for you today? It's like in our scripture lesson for today, when John the Baptist burst on the scene and he was preparing the way for the ministry of Jesus Christ and he was preaching and he was calling people to repentance. And some of them didn't. They said, okay, we've repented. What do we do now? Now they knew they weren't supposed to sin. They knew what the sins were and they knew that they should worship and love God, but they felt like there was something more they should be doing. They felt like there should be some positive expression of the fact that they had repented, that they were leading this new life. They want to know, what does this mean to my job? What does this mean to my business? What does this mean to my day-to-day -day living? They do it ought to be different, but they just weren't sure what it ought to be. And so John told them, if you have more than you need, share it with others. Soldiers came and he said, you know, don't use your power to be bullies. Use your power for justice. Use your power to keep things right. And even tax collectors came and he said, you know, 
Do what's necessary, but don't cheat people. Don't take advantage. John knew that forgiveness was a gift of God. It was not something we earn or create. But he also knew that those who repent, those who are forgiven, there ought to be something. He called them fruit. There ought to be fruits. There ought to be results. There ought to be signs that something has happened, that something is now different. Oddly enough, Christians sometimes have a hard time figuring out what it is they ought to be doing. Sometimes they spend too much time thinking. Sometimes they get too much, spend too much time arguing about theological issues and what we believe. And what we believe is important. But Christians have invested a lot of time in arguing about the things that are either stupid or unknowable. I mean, Christians really have in the past argued about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. And even in our time, Christians argue and discuss and debate when Jesus Christ is coming back, when the Scripture clearly tells us, you're not going to know. Don't worry, you won't miss it when it happens. But you're not going to know when. Sometimes Christians are afraid to talk about what they do because they're afraid it might look like they were trying to earn God's favor. They were trying to work their way into heaven because they know that, yes, we are saved by faith. We are saved by the grace of God. There is nothing we can do to, to, to make God love us, but that's okay because God loves us already. There is nothing we can do to add up enough good things to earn our salvation, but that's okay because through Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. And the slate can be made clean. And so they, they, the people, when they start talking about, well, what do I do? Some people say, oh, no, don't worry about what you do because it's all in what you believe. We believe that we're saved by faith alone. But sometimes we forget that what we believe and what we do are very closely connected. You've heard me say it before, and you're going to hear me say it as long as I'm here. Every once in a while, I will come back. What we believe will show itself in what we do. And that's the truth. Jesus knew that. Jesus said when he comes back again, he won't be asking, oh, what do you believe? He said, I'll know my own because they are the ones who are feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. They're the ones who carry a glass of water to the thirsty or reach out to the stranger. They're the ones who help the sick or visit those in prison. I will know my own because that's how they'll be behaving. Paul knew the same thing. He says over in Galatians, my brothers and sisters, you are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. And of course, you've heard me quote James before. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Second chapter. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to him, go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe in God? Even the demons believe that and shudder. Our faith shows itself in what we do. What we believe does matter. But what we believe has to come out in how we live our lives. John Wesley believed that. That's part of the reason that there is a Methodist church. When John Wesley burst on the scene, he came kind of as a traveling evangelist, kind of like a Billy Graham, kind of like John the Baptist. He was calling people to repent. He was calling people to turn to Jesus Christ. And some of them did. But then they said, okay, what do we do now? And the church in his day really wasn't set up to help them. The church existed, but the church was mostly about worship. Sunday school was just getting started in some places, but Sunday school was just for the children. In most churches, in most parishes, a few tried something, but in most parishes, there was no Bible study. There was no Sunday school class for adults. There was no prayer group. There were no mission teams. And so John Wesley said, we need to be together. And so the people who came to him, they said, what do we do now? He got them together in little groups. He called them classes called them bands. He called them societies. 
First, because he knew that we need each other. He once wrote, The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. And now he may be using social in a little different way than we use it today, but it means people. It means our religion is not private. It means our faith, our worship, our service, our study, our holding each other accountable, our fellowship. Everything we do, we do in and around and for other people. Whether it's in our Sunday school class or our church or our neighborhood or our community or out in God's word, world, whatever we do, we do with people. So we bring people together in these small groups and they would study the scriptures and they would hold each other accountable. You think it's hard being a Methodist today? It was tough being a Methodist back then. You'd go to your class meeting, the first question is, how is it with your soul? And the second question is, what sins have you committed this week? And what have you done about them? And so it was a, it was a pretty testing group, but they held each other accountable. And they studied the Word, and they prayed for each other, and they prayed for problems. And then when the class was over, they'd go out and carry a food basket to someone or go and visit in the prison. That's why the early Methodists did things. Wesley put together some rules for these societies. One of the questions they asked preachers when they are ordained is, do you know our general rules? Well, our general rules go on for about three pages in our discipline, and I wouldn't want to call any of my brethren or sister in liars, but I would think that most of them who stand up there before the bishop say, yes, I know the general rules of the church, could not recite half of them, but that's the way it is. They are rather extensive. And they come in three groups. I got my brand new discipline. You know, it's interesting. We, we call our book that guides us in Methodist the book of discipline. It, that's always what we've been about is trying to be disciplined Christians. But the rules kind of came in three groups. And the first one was do no harm by avoiding evil of every kind, especially that which is most generally practiced, such as, and he goes on and gives a list of specific examples, taking the name of God in vain, uh, doing to others as we would not they should do unto us, drunkenness, buying or selling spiritist liquors or drinking them unless in cases of extreme necessity. Now, there have been spirited discussions about what extreme necessity is. <laughs> That's a whole other sermon, too. Some of them are more to their time, slaveholding the buying and selling of slaves. Some of them could very easily be adapted to our time, taking such diversions as cannot be used in the name of the Lord Jesus. That would take away most of our work on Facebook and and email. But he said, first thing, you're Christians. Stop doing these things. Stop doing things that hurt other people. Stop doing things that hurt yourself. Stop doing things that hurt our witness. First, Do no harm. Then the second group is by doing good. By being in every kind merciful after their power, as they have opportunity, doing every possible sort, as far as possible, to all people, to their bodies, feeding the hungry, helping the sick, to their souls, teaching, witnessing, preaching as if necessary, helping their souls doing good to the church, lifting up the church, bringing the church together. And then lastly, he says, I'm paraphrasing, but he says it, is is being out there in the world in such a way that no one can look at the Christian and say they don't practice what they preach. Being out there in such a way as to live out your faith so that it witnesses to the world that we do love, that we do care, that we do follow Jesus Christ. The last group of the rules... Mr. Wesley said, by attending upon all the ordinances of God, and then he lists them, public worship, the ministry of the word, whether read or expounded, the supper of the Lord, family and private prayer, searching the scriptures, fasting or abstinence. It is a long list. A few years ago, a Methodist bishop wrote a little book that summed them up as best he could. He said, it's really this three rules. Do no harm. Do good. And he phrased it, stay in love with God. And I would argue that maybe a better paraphrase for what Mr. Wesley was trying to say is, do the things that keep you in love with God. Read your Bible. Pray. Worship. Do those things that connect you with God. Because as I said last Sunday night, it's a lot like being married. Love is work. 
And even loving God takes work sometimes. And we have to practice it through our scripture, through our prayer, through our devotions. That's how we get closer to God. But those rules, do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. That defines what a Methodist is. That is supposed to define who we are. And the question as we come into this new year, if we are Christians, and I know that's an assumption, but I'm going to assume there are a few Christians out here, <laughs> is that what do we do now? How do we live? How are we going to live out not just the, these rules, but how do we live out the fact that a love has been poured down upon us? Because we're, we're doing it in response to God's love. God already loves us. Jesus Christ has already died for us. God has already done all these things that are necessary to prepare for our salvation. So we're not doing it to earn God's favor. We're not doing it to earn our place in heaven. But we're doing it because we're loved. We're doing it to say thank you to a God who has already done so much for us. So how do we respond to God's love? How do we love God back? How do we love our neighbor how do we live as Christians? How do we be disciples? How will we be Methodist in this new year that God has given us? That's the challenge. To be the people that God knows we can be and that God wants us to be. As a, God's love is poured down upon us. And the question is, how do we respond? What do we do next? That's the question Methodists have been trying to answer. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for your love and grace that are ever upon us. Help us. Help us to live in love in response to love. Help us to live in thankfulness. Help us to live as followers of your Son. We pray in his name. Amen. As always, during our last hymn, we open the door of our church. Then you would be a part of this church family. The hymn is number 57. Let's stand to sing all the verses.
you for sharing this day with us. And now may you go in peace, knowing that the love of God your Father, grace through His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit go with you.